Yup, can you start by clarifying what exactly Google Cloud, uh, I'm sorry, what exactly Twitter is moving to Google Cloud? Thank you for hosting us today. Uh, we are migrating our ad hoc and our cold storage use cases to cloud. That takes about a third of our Hadoop infrastructure, hence our project name, partly cloudy. You said ad hoc and cold. Um, what does that mean? Ad hoc is exploratory data analysis. What's cold? Yeah, we have different use cases for different, uh, different clusters for different use cases. Uh, original data lands on RT clusters. Uh, that's where the original data comes in. Then ad hoc and exploratory use cases run on um, ad hoc clusters. Production clusters run the repeat jobs that run over and over and over again. Those sit on production clusters. And our cold storage is more for data that is less, ex less accessed and uh, less frequently used. Is it fair to say that the production clusters are batch jobs versus the ad hoc clusters are kind of like off the cuff jobs? Yeah, most of the jobs on the Hadoop clusters are, are batch. Um, it's the, di the difference between production and ad hoc is more that there's, you know, the ad hoc is interactive and less predictable, whereas production jobs are you know, the repeat jobs that run over and over and over again that are more predictable. Great, and I believe you blogged about this yesterday as well, right? Yes, we have a blog post out, and uh, most of those links will end up uh, being on cloud.google.com for slash Twitter. So why Google Cloud? A couple of years ago, we ended up doing a large evaluation of uh, multiple vendors, and we, you know, we measured many different things, did a lot of benchmarking, and particularly uh, the network capability, the ability to be able to separate storage from compute, and to be able to scale uh, the compute independently from the storage. Uh, those were all deciding factors. And one of the other very large deciding factors was the, the technical capabilities and interaction with all of the engineers on the Google side that um, you know, has shown a great partnership so far. Cool. So before getting into the details of your Hadoop infrastructure, I'd like to get the audience involved in our discussion. Uh, tweet your question with this hashtag. The hashtag will be repeated throughout the future slides on the bottom left. Um, Ashim, uh, who's raising his hand in the front, will be sharing your questions live from Twitter with us throughout the panel, but also at the end of the panel, where we'll do a dedicated 10 or 15 minutes Q&A. Um, so we won't be do using Dory for this session. We'll take the questions live from Twitter with the hashtag. So let's talk uh, about Hadoop uh, as it runs at Twitter on-prem at scale right now. So th these are pretty massive numbers, um, 500,000 cores, more than 10,000 node clusters. Um, Lohit, can you talk a bit about the challenges involved with running Hadoop at this scale? Uh, sure. So there are uh, several challenges, uh, but I would like to point out that scalability is like probably at the very top. Um, we, uh, whatever features we implement or uh, any new infrastructure we plan to build, from the very beginning, we considered scalability. A um, couple of years back, uh, when we started off uh, with our Hadoop clusters, we had about like 2,000 node Hadoop clusters. And that, at that time, um, the largest known, publicly known Hadoop cluster was about 4,000 nodes. And our challenge, our target was to build a 6,000 node cluster. So uh, right from HDFS to YARN, uh, be it uh, the applications, libraries, like for example, shared cache, whatever features we had to build, we had to think about scalability. And today we have uh, our single largest clusters are more than 12,500 nodes, uh, and we have multiple of them. Yeah, I mean, that, that's pretty amazing. Is that one single Hadoop cluster, one name node that's serving out 12,500 nodes? So that's a very good question. It's actually multiple name nodes. We could have anywhere between six to eight name mm -hmm. nodes. Traditionally, uh, the architecture of HDFS was that a single name node could not scale. Uh, so uh, Hadoop community uh, and we uh, invested a lot of time in uh, federation, HDFS federation, client-side mount tables, to make it more scalable to 12,500 hosts. Wow. And uh, Yup, are you running a, uh, your Hadoop directly from Apache, or is it a vendor distribution? You can imagine at our scale, we're building our own Hadoop distribution that is very close to Apache. Um, so when we first started with Hadoop 2, we were one of the earlier ones to run 2.0 alpha. And then you know, we worked with the community. There was a newer release. Then we leapfrogged them and jumped to a 2.2, and et cetera, et cetera. So you know, we're very close to an open source uh, distribution, maybe a you know, couple of dozen to 100 patches difference, but very, very close. And those are typically patches that go in upstream as well. 
Cool, yeah, I know you guys are a, a very major contributor to open source Hadoop as well, so thanks for that. Uh, Rishali, I'm curious about the compute cores, half a million compute cores. What uh, Apache engines are you running there? Right, hello. So in data platform, right, we support a bunch of technologies for doing data processing. Uh, our production clusters run scalding jobs, so most of our production workload is all scalding. Uh, in addition to scalding, what we've seen is people want to use, uh, people want to have different ways of getting at the data, right? They want to use different technologies. So we also have Spark, Hive, uh, Presto on our ad hoc clusters, yeah. So a variety of them. What about the um, 300 petabytes of logical storage, Rishali? What kind of data file formats are you guys using? Uh, on HDFS, uh, we have uh, LZO, Thrift, and Parquet as our main file formats. We also have a few uh, regular text files. I see. And, um, you know, Loha, this is something that I found really interesting when I worked with you guys on this project, that 1.5 trillion messages a day, and even the 300 petabyte number, how do you get to 1.5 trillion messages a day? Um, surely there's not quite that many tweets per day. Uh, and each tweet is only about 280 characters. How does that build up to 300 petabytes? Yeah, so that, that's a very good question. So the actual tweet text itself is a very small percentage. So whenever users visit uh, twitter.com or uh, use the Twitter mobile, right? So there are a lot of uh, things they're doing, the interactions, the timeline, the uh, order of tweets they see, uh, who to follow, suggestions, the search they do. So all these actions generate something called as events. And uh, we collect uh, our framework um, is capable of aggregating about 1.5 trillion events every day. That's about uh, 1 billion uh, events every minute. Wow. Yeah, this is a massive migration. Rishali, can you talk a bit about which teams were involved um, to accomplish this? So for the Partly Cloudy project, uh, it was not just the Hadoop team at Twitter. Uh, pretty much all of the teams in data infrastructure were involved. Teams that own Scalding, Presto, the analytical data tool, tools that we have, all of the libraries. And then it wasn't just data infrastructure. Uh, we actually worked with several teams at Twitter, like the network engineering team, the public cloud services team, uh, the platform security team. Uh, and then it was not just Twitter going at this all alone. We actually work very closely with Google on this. We, in fact, have an on-site Google presence at Twitter. So we have people from the Google Professional Services Organization who, mm -hmm. who are on-site at Twitter working very closely with us. I mean, you, you, you guys seem like a very competent Hadoop group. Why did you decide to engage Google Cloud Professional Services on this engagement? Well, we know how to run the Hadoop clusters on-premise. You can imagine that as many companies have done over the past decade, we've built a lot of plumbing and infrastructure. I mean, we, it's like the larger Twitter, Twitter engineering work, right? So from how we build services, how we deploy them, how we do have configuration, how we do monitoring, uh, how we do alerting, all of that infrastructure is, is in place and is built out for the infrastructure within our data centers itself. So we know how to run clusters and how to run services in our own data centers. As we decided to expand that out to Google Cloud, you know, we decided to engage uh, with the Google partners to make sure that you know, have a much higher chance of success in making this successful. And, you know, as, and through this partnership, um, you know, Google folks have found out that you know, some of the Twitter cases are slightly different maybe than what you're used to, and we've made improvements you know, alongside with you guys. Um, and on our side, we're trying to just, you know, make sure that we do things well on, on the cloud side. And for our users, we're trying to make sure that, you know, things are as similar as we can, so they have the same experience on-premise as the well as uh, they have in cloud. Interesting. And Rishali, what are we looking at here with the work streams? Uh, how did you guys decide to organize the different um, work streams, I suppose? Right. So we had this goal of extending Twitter's data platform to a hybrid cloud model, right? On-premises and cloud. So in order to reach this goal, we started by identifying the top broad work stream areas that were needed to be done in order to get to this hybrid model. And as each work stream began to evolve, you know, we came up with milestones, and those milestones brought forward the dependencies that existed between the different components and services that needed to be completed in order to reach that milestone. And Pretty much as we kept working on this, we realized that we needed a very close collaboration between all of the teams, not just within Twitter, but also with Google to make this adoption of GCP at Twitter successful. So you used an interesting word. You said extending your data architecture to the cloud. Um, does that mean you're 
keeping the on-prem clusters and extending it, the, the feature set to the cloud, or are you uh, fully migrating certain Hadoop clusters to the cloud? So we are migrating our ad hoc and our cold data storage to GCP. We are still keeping our production clusters on premises. So some of the clusters will continue to remain on premises, and we will have new clusters, like ad hoc clusters, that will come up in GCP. I see. So here we're looking at the transition. There will be clusters in both on-premise and in cloud. So there will be a period where both will be live lab. until the, you know, the, the migration is fully complete. And at that point, we'll have ad hoc clusters only in cloud. Interesting. Um, you, can you walk us through this diagram? We're looking at the partly cloudy architecture here. Yeah, what we're looking at here is a little bit of our target architecture. Um, as represented by the Twitter birds on your left-hand side, that's for all of our users interacting with the different systems. These, uh, as Lowit said, these users you know, generate all these events that land into our, uh, through our log pipeline onto our RT clusters. That's our, what we call the real-time clusters. Those clusters are also used to serve some outgoing data sets into production servers. Um, and then that data is collected through a log pipeline and goes into production servers. Um, this picture shows that our ad hoc clusters are fully migrated into cloud. This is the target architecture. And what we've done here is that we're separating our storage um, into GCS. So that all of the, the files and objects are going to be stored in GCS. Um, and, the, and the analysis is going to be running on um, both Hadoop clusters as well as other tools. We will have uh, Presto and other tools that, um, that we'll use as well. So, so the ad hoc cluster has a Google Compute Engine logo, logo next to it. Um, is that what you're using to run your ad hoc clusters? Yeah, the ad hoc clusters itself will be large shared clusters that we're running on uh, compute instances. Um, there's other cases where we use Dataproc. That's underneath Presto. That's an example. There's other examples where uh, we spin up temporary Dataproc clusters to load data into BigQuery, for example. So there's other cases where those are used. Uh, I'm curious to dig into that a little bit more. How did you guys decide to kind of move your stack from on-prem as a uh, as it is, I suppose, to Google Cloud, as opposed to using managed service like Dataproc. Yeah, there's the choice to either have all of Dataproc, have everything as a managed service. Um, you can imagine, you know, when you run a handful of, of uh, jobs in a day, then using a, a cluster per job is a totally appropriate situation. At our scale, when running 80,000, 100,000, 150,000 jobs in a day, if you were to launch 150,000 clusters in a day and then have to keep track of who run what where, that becomes very difficult to do. Um, at the same time, it is also very difficult to judge how big that cluster needs to be. So if there's an ad hoc case, users don't necessarily know ahead of time how big the cluster needs to be. So if, there were, if everybody were to launch a 2,000 node cluster, um, then that would be very inefficient and there would be very low utilization at that point. Now that's, that's the reason why we're running larger shared clusters. I see multi-tenant clusters. Yeah, I think that's a really fair point you're making about Dataproc. Um, actually, last week we released the GCP broker uh, service to actually address a integration of Dataproc with Kerberos, where you can have multi-users within a Dataproc cluster as well. Um, I'm also curious about the Google Cloud storage, Lohit. What kind of buckets are you guys using for GCS? Um, so for most part, we are using something called as a dual region buckets, um, okay. where uh, uh, if we load the data into those buckets from two of the regions, uh, the data will automatically be uh, replicated um, and consistently be available from the two regions, not spread across the entire uh, region, like for example, US region or something. I see, yeah. It looks like Ashim has a yeah. question from Twitter. Uh, yeah, so uh, there were a couple of questions around Dataproc, which I think uh, we answered, but uh, one new question that came up was, how are you thinking about storing tweet impression data? What data models uh, or tools are you leveraging? This is from Kat on Twitter. So the question is, what data models are we, are we using? Yes, yeah, so what data models or tools are you leveraging? So, so from a change from on-premise to cloud, the, the, our users are going to still use the same tools that they're using on-prem. So the, the, the change from on-premise to cloud is not going to change this, the format or the storage of how tweets or our data is stored. That remains the same. Yeah, so to add to that, for uh, most of the uh, data, right, like. Uh, so if uh, a service, a new microservice is emitting uh, some events, so they have a well-defined schema associated with that. And for most part, it's uh, like a thrift uh, schema. And then we compress it using LZO. So it's like a LZO thrift format, as Vrishali told. And look, talking more about disks, are you using persistent disks as well on like the ad hoc cluster? Because I can see Google Cloud Storage there. 
so yes, it's a combination of uh, persistent disk uh, and GCS. So what we are, uh, first when we started to evaluate, uh, we thought about options of running just HDFS on those uh, VMs, uh, which would be very inefficient. Uh, because you need to replicate like three ways for HDFS. So what we ended up doing was um, in a MapReduce, uh, generally, typically in an analytics pipeline, a MapReduce has multiple stages where output of one stage uh, gets written to disk, and the next stage reads that data, uh, does some processing, and then writes to disk again. So for that intermediate stages uh, for fast access and temporary data, we are using persistent disk, but the uh, initial input and the final output is on GCS. I see, so the source of truth is GCS, but you use the persistent disk as like shuffle space or intermediate job storage right. space. And the advantage of that as well is that we can now use other uh, cloud native tools to leverage that. So if people want to use Dataproc, or in some cases BigQuery, they can use directly that data from GCS, and we don't have to store that multiple times. I see. So I definitely want to dig a little bit more into the details here, but before we move on, can you talk a little bit about the log pipeline, Lohit? Like, what exactly is happening there? And you're writing to real-time clusters, and then it goes to a production cluster. What exactly does that pipeline look like? Uh, good. So as I said uh, in the very beginning, uh, the actions, uh, uh, users' actions, actions generate like a lot of these events. So each of these events has a name associated with it, which ultimately translates to a data set name. So the log pipeline is responsible for aggregating all the events which we, re uh, which we receive from thousands of different uh, servers, aggregate all of them, and then write it as log files on HDFS, uh, usually time partition. We do it on an hourly boundary. Uh, we, we also do some cleansing format conversion uh, depending on the data set. And then we have a replication framework which takes care of copying the data from real-time cluster to production or other places. Okay. Um, I also do want to mention that, that we call it real-time because those are the clusters which are like the incoming clusters. Um, the uptime on those clusters are like several years. We rarely take down the cluster. Do you run any Hadoop jobs on those real-time clusters? Uh, we do not run Hadoop jobs uh, mainly because of this reason, because Hadoop jobs uh, can be unpredictable uh, depending on like user actions. So it's mostly these clusters are like incoming clusters to get the data and then serve some subset of data sets. So you mentioned the data replicator. Uh, I'm assuming the data replicator is moving the data from these uh, on-premise clusters between each other. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how it works when you use the data replicator to move data to the cloud? Sure. So uh, we already have a well-defined uh, like uh, service data replicator with given a source and a destination and a data set. It can uh, keep track of changes at the source and make sure all the data is synced to the destination. Whenever new data sets are arrive in source, it will make sure that that data is replicated. So for GCS, what we did was um, uh, we created uh, something called as a copy cluster, which is like an in-transit cluster. Uh, which has direct connect, uh, connectivity to uh, the Google endpoints. And we set up a similar replicator like how we have uh, for on-prem, for cloud also, and then said, OK, source is our input HDFS cluster, and destination is GCS. This is interesting. I mean, for the audience members who might not be familiar with DCP, mm -hmm. can you explain what distributed copy is? And I'm kind of curious about why the data, is the data replicator just kind of kicking off the CP jobs, or what is it exactly doing um, there? Sure. So uh, see, as I said, so for a particular data set, we have a well-defined partitions, in this case, hourly yeah. partitions, right? I see so that in the year, month, day, day hour, I hour, guess. Right? Yeah. So this data set on cluster X. So what, this, what the data replicator does here is that for every new hourly partition it sees at the source, it kicks off one DCP job, mm -hmm. right? So the DCP job is uh, our standard MapReduce uh, application. Uh, it basically copies a lot of files in parallel, uh, taking advantage of the parallelism of a Hadoop cluster. So if you want to make it go fast, you just throw in more mappers, and then it can copy the data. Um, uh, so yeah, so that's that's the DCP job, which is reading the data. And here you can see that the copy cluster, uh, even though it's a Hadoop cluster, it never saves any data locally. It's not stored in the copy cluster and then copied to GCS. It's a pass-through uh, DCP. I see. And 
You, what, what is that? Uh, sorry. So there's oh, Ashim, go ahead. So there's another question around uh, security, but I think uh, we can tackle this on uh, Presto question, which is similar. Did you have to make any changes for Presto to work on GCP? So yes, I think that's on the previous slide. Uh, so we are running some Presto clusters in GCP as well. Uh, we had to make some changes to Presto, and those changes were basically requ required because we wanted to follow our triple A design principles. So triple A meaning authentication, authorization, and auditing. So authentication is when you know users identify themselves as who they are. So if a user says, let's say I say I'm Rushali, I need to identify myself, let's say with my driver's license or something, I should be able to say who I am, right? Mm -hmm. That is authentication. Authorization is when we want to make sure that users can actually access the data that they're trying to access. So are they authorized to access that data? And auditing is when uh, we want to know who accessed which data set when, and we wanted to have a very clear-cut way of determining that. So those three AAA design principles uh, made us make some changes to Presto. Yeah. Interesting. And, and Presto has a data proc logo next to it. Is that what you guys are using right now to run Presto? Yes, that is correct. Yeah. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about the scale that you guys have benchmarked or tested Presto in Google Cloud? Uh, so we've We've run our data proc with about uh, Presto with about um, 90,000 co cores. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's interesting because I think that's the largest data proc cluster that has ever been launched, as far as I know, for, for public customers. Um, before we move on into a little. Hold, hold my beer. We'll, we'll uh, launch more large clusters soon. Okay, well, you'll beat your own record very soon then. Um, before we move away from the data replication slide, um, Lohit, uh, I'm curious also about the 800 gigabits. I mean, th that's. Uh, a very fat network pipe, to say the least. Um, how is that network configured? H how do you handle security around that? Um, curious. Yeah, so when we decided to uh, set up uh, these copy replication from our on-prem Hadoop clusters to GCS, right? Um, so what we uh, decided was uh, the data, uh, there are some metadata operations uh, which the data replicator uh, or services has to do to, say, look up the source and destination directory, make sure like all the files are there or not. Those are like metadata operations, but the actual bulk transfer, the data transfer would be like in the order of like petabytes of data, mm -hmm. right? So our network engineers, what they, uh, with Google folks, what they uh, ended up doing is to uh, do a, like a Twitter, Google um, uh, PNI uh, setup, uh, private interconnect between us, and we uh, provide a 800 gigabits per second uh, bandwidth. Now all the, uh, nodes in the copy cluster have direct access to the uh, GCS endpoints. Is that what the orange um, thing is? So the orange thing is a uh, very interesting stuff. Um, so that is the Google uh, Hadoop connector. So uh, Hadoop file system is like an abstract file system. Uh, HDFS is in fact just an implementation of that interface. So what Google ended up doing was they implemented the same interface. Uh, so any uh, uh, API file system API calls would be automatically translated to the Google Cloud Storage APIs using that connector. It's like a library. So the advantage now is that any application which is using the Hadoop APIs don't need to change anything. So they can interact with Google Cloud Storage as if it's like any other Hadoop storage. So for most part, we didn't have to make any code changes in the data replicator. Uh, so we just plugged it in, and then GCP would just work. Sure. As um, I definitely want to come back to the GCS connector again. I, I know that there are some really interesting developments that happened in GCS connector because of the Twitter project. But before I move away from this slide, you, I, I'm curious, 800 gigabits, that's a fat pipe, like I said before. So that means, like, I, think, I did some math before this talk. One petabyte you can move in just under three hours. So 300 petabytes would be about 35 days um, if you have the pipe running at full stream. Uh, with that in mind, how long is this data migration project taking? Yeah, we've done some modeling. And if you were to go full bore and, and pump it across, it would take about four months. Keep in mind that uh, this data is not a static data set either, right? So new, new pieces of information keep coming in. 
and in the days of, of privacy and data protection and GDPR regulations, some of these data sets are also getting scrubbed. So it used to be that, uh, for example, an hour worth of tweets was written once and would never be changed. They would, you know, we would consider it to be very cold data sets. They're written once and only the new hours are coming in. As you have uh, your right to be forgotten and those kind of functionalities have to be implemented, some of these partitions actually get rewritten. So as, as the time goes by, as you're copying data and as it's progressing, some of this data is changing and is modifying. So the way we're setting this up, and the reason why we have a copy cluster is that that is also providing some funneling where we can do prioritization. The latest hour can be copied first, and then in the, in the, in the valley of the, you know, during the peak you have the new hour that, of data that comes in, and then in the valley where the, the network traffic is, is less utilized, we can do the backfill part. I see. Um, Rochelle, can you give us just a sense of how many da data sets are involved that you have on premise at Twitter? And is this all moving to one G massive GCS bucket? So, so when we were thinking of how to move this data set on HDFS you know, into GCS, we had a few different options, right? Either we could just put everything in one bucket and have everybody access it, uh, but then that doesn't sound very good, right? So we had the other option of uh, trying to group together data sets and put them in you know, some, some buckets. Uh, but then the model that we picked was going with a data set ownership model. Mm -hmm. So every data set owner, a per data set owner, we create one bucket. And that is what we ended up with. How many data sets are there? About hundreds of data sets. Close to thousand, I mean, thousand, I would say, yeah. And how do you um, organize your architecture within Google Cloud? So for organizing these buckets, right, we wanted to think about how we want to put them in projects. Either we could put them again in one project and have everybody just run all of their resources there. But then at our scale, that becomes too big and unwieldy. So then we thought about going, you know, the other, the other extreme that would be having one project per small application. But again, at our scale, that becomes too big to manage. So we picked a, a middle ground, and we said, OK, let's have a, one project per business unit. So for example, for Twitter infrastructure engineering, we have one GCP project. For Twitter revenue, we have one. So that way, we have a few handful of projects that we can manage. Mm -hmm. And then we organize our buckets within those projects. So having a few projects does give us some delineation, some boundaries between what we want to do across these projects, but then I, we have a few of them to manage, not too many or just one. Sure. I, I mean, so you, if I understand the scope of these projects, there's like billing scopes and perhaps security scopes. Um, but wh what exactly is in these projects? I see like a Hadoop logo and a GCS bucket. So how many Hadoop clusters are running in these projects and how many GCS buckets are in these projects? Yeah, like I said, the, the, the project is a delineation and is a sort of security boundary as well. So within each project, we're running one Hadoop cluster that is shared. And this is, again, done for fragmentation purposes. If you had one very large cluster, that would be great from fragmentation perspective because all the users bin packed very well together. If you were to go to the very other extreme where you run one cluster per job, you have a huge amount of fragmentation. And whenever the cluster is not fully used, it's going to sit around idle. So we chose the middle ground where we end up delineating and saying one cluster for each of these pillar projects, or pillar organizations, we, we call them. And then all of the buckets that, are in the, that belong to all of the users that are in that pillar organization fall along those lines. So there will be a, a set of buckets for each user. There will be a set of buckets for each log category. Um, and to clarify, you know, when we think of data sets, there, there's sort of roughly two sets of data sets that we're thinking of. You have the, in, in the initial log categories, and that's an order of magnitude of 1,000. Mm -hmm. And you have about 1,000 individual users of order of magnitude of that. And they each have you know, dozens of their own data sets. So the total number of data sets is fairly large. But if you think of the incoming log um, categories that Lohit um, explained, that's an order of magnitude of 1,000. So there will be several thousand uh, buckets for each of these projects. Interesting. So, Rochelle, I want to go back to the AAA. Um, uh, I think you said authentication, authorization, and auditing. That is right, yes. Um, I want to go back to that and, and think about that a little bit. So, um, authentication, I think that's just a user says they are who they are. Mm -hmm. right. um, yep. Authorization, you got to give them permission to do something. And finally, auditing. Can you talk a little bit about that in respect to how you set up your security model? and user permissions for Hadoop? Right. 
So, so let's start by understanding how users do their work on premises and, and in GCP, right? So we have users, that's the blue, blue figure there. Uh, so every user has a Unix account, right, that, that they use to run their day-to-day on-premise jobs, you know, on in-cluster, uh, whatever work they need to do. Now, this user also has a G Suite account that they use for their email, their Google Docs, Sheets, all, all of that work. Now, when we look, think about uh, a process running, right, the process runs as a Unix user. Now, that process needs to read data or write, write to GCS. Now, in order to do that, it needs to have the right permissions. One way, is, one way to access the data in GCS is via G Suite. But then that means that you need to provision the G Suite credentials on the VM node, right? We do not want to do that. So we pick. Why? So we do not want to provision the G Suite credentials on a particular VM because a person who has admin privileges on the VM then can act as that user. Mm -hmm. So then that person would have access to their G Suite, uh, Google Docs, Gmail, all of that. Right? Mm -hmm. So on the VMs, we provision a shadow account, what, what we call as a shadow account per user. What is a shadowing? So a shadow account is nothing but a Google service account, a Google service account that exists in GCP. And there is one GCP account, one GCP service account per Unix user. And a Google service account has a set of keys associated with it. And those keys and that account is provisioned on those VMs. So that way, you only have that account that, and the key that is existing on that node, mm -hmm. but it is transparent to the user themselves when they're running a job. Th think of that yeah. as when you uh, park your car and you come and you have valet parking. When you hand over your key, um, you, you, know, you may not want the, the person parking your car to be able to get into your glove compartment. But this is actually one step further. If you want to also be able to say, well, this person can drive your car and can drive slow, but they cannot drive to the freeway. Uh -huh. uh, they can drive around, but they cannot have a party in the back. That's not okay. So this essentially is a different set of keys that provides you a subset of functionality that act a little bit as the user, but not in all particular accounts. So when, okay. when a Hadoop cluster runs a job under my credentials and load as an administrator, he can see the, the, the task running, but he cannot access my Google account um, on Gmail or in my Google Drive. But these are just normal Google service accounts. It sounds like you're multiplexing them within the same cluster to some extent. You're, you're sharing many of them within the same cluster. So there is one Google service account per Unix user. Per user, okay. And only that Unix user can read the keys or access the keys of that service account. Uh, yeah, but you know, you, that sounds like a security flaw. I mean, if you have one service account per user, what if that gets com compromised? Well, keys, comprom keys getting compromised is always a bad situation. In this case, it's actually better if a key gets compromised to have the shadow key compromised because then the user can access only GCS and not their G Suite account. Mm. In addition to that, we end up rotating these keys so it becomes a little bit easier. Uh, this is transparent uh, for each individual user. So when a user logs in or SSH into a box and they access an Hadoop cluster or they access GCS, transparently behind the scenes, um, the shadow account keys are, are being leveraged. And those keys can rotate over time and they're, they're valid only for a few days. That is much simpler okay. than their G Suite account keys or other keys that may have to live longer and that users to be aware of. So, okay, just stepping back, Loha, can you walk me through the user experience? Uh, imagine I'm an engineer at Twitter, I want to submit a Hadoop job, and now I want to submit it to Google Cloud. How is my user experience different? Like, what am I doing? Am I SSHing into something new? Am I submitting it through a, a browser? Like, how do I actually submit a Hadoop job once Twitter is in Google Cloud? So that's a very good question. So most of the like the foundational stuff which we have build we have been building is to make sure that like users have a uniform um, way of accessing the stuff in GCS, just like how they do internally. So what we ended up doing in this particular case is that uh, we created something called as jump hosts, or we call like nest boxes, where users log in uh, using their like Unix account. Once they log into that box automatically uh, we provision their shadow accounts um, JSON key only for them. Uh, it will be accessible only for them, uh, using which they can access any of the GCP resources. Along with that, some of the uh, resources, we also provision their G Suite um, permissions to access some data. So if there are tools such as BigQuery where they have to access it from UI, so uh, since the access to the data and the tables in this case, 
um, have been granted permission, they will be access, able to access either via web browser or these jump hosts. One last question. I mean, before we go to Ashim, uh, who, who seems to, there's another question from the audience. But before that, you mentioned a nest box. You assist into the nest box, you submit the job. Mm -hmm. um, on premise, I'm assuming it's the same thing. So you're saying the user experience is kind of very similar. Exactly. So you, the same tools which users are used uh, on prem, uh, they are made available on those next nest boxes as well. But w what about like um, GCS, right? So can users still access GCS through the Google Cloud Console through the web browser? Yes, they can. And they can also use the, as I mentioned earlier, there is this uh, Google Hadoop uh, connector. Uh -huh. So using that, we have created mappings uh, for the users. So uh, just like they access HDFS using Hadoop commands and then a well-defined path, we have created a new mount point for the GCS to say slash GCS and then any path within the I see, so instead of HDFS name node name, it's just GC, GS, I believe. Yes. So it's kind of transparent. Exactly. Uh, Shim, do you have a question? Yeah, so uh, there are two last questions before, before we open up up to the floor later. Uh, first, uh, since BigQuery came up, did you think of replacing parts or all of your Hadoop cluster with BigQuery and Bigtable? Short answer is yes. We are thinking we'll probably have a combination of both. So some use cases that will be more appropriate on BigQuery, other cases uh, Presto is more appropriate for us, and other cases users are still using um, Hadoop to run their jobs because you know, they're doing analysis and then later on they will run that same job in production. You, how do your users decide if they want to run a SQL query through Presto or Spark or Hive? The exact details of how we're going to decide between all of the various cases we're going to still determine. And we're doing an, uh, you know, we're in an earlier alpha test mode now with some of our users. And you know, we're going to find out you know, what the most appropriate tool is. Cool. Was there another question? Yeah, and last question uh, from online is, uh, this must cost a ton. Do you have any tips? Uh, to take advantage of how to keep the costs under control, particularly with regards to data proc and GCS. So I, I think being in, in the cloud model, being in GC, uh, GCP, right, uh, there are a lot of advantages to that. Uh, rather than looking at just the cost, if you look at the advantages that we get by Google's networking setup, the fact that we can separate compute and storage, right, all of those advantages add up. So it's really difficult to say okay, whether we are focusing on the storage cost versus all of these other advantages that we are getting. And, uh, this is also one of the reasons why we're running a, a larger shared Hadoop cluster where individual jobs can interleave together. So if there's a job, is, there's multiple stages of a map reduce job, and, and the job is, for example, at a stage with a single reducer, the cluster is not going to sit around idle because other users will use that same cluster. We we'll end up you know, being able to very closely monitor which users use which resources and have a mapping. And at the end, our users are going to be responsible, our engineers are responsible to make sure that they use the tools in an appropriate manner. This is the same as what we do on-premise. Sometimes users will run jobs. Now, we, we see sometimes see jobs that are running 300,000 mappers and 200,000 reducers. This can happen. And it's a balance between making it as simple as we can for users to use and not have to think about it, and at the same time, you know, if the cost becomes very high, then users have to rationalize and, and think through, like, is this the most appropriate thing to do for a business? And they make that choice. You mentioned something that I think is worth um, diving a little bit more into. You mentioned separation of compute from storage, which is not what you learn about when you read, like, Hadoop, the definitive guide. The whole idea of Hadoop is to keep storage close to compute. Um, there's many benefits there, like the map task can start near where one of the three replicas of the data block is. When you separated out Hadoop at your scale, um, separated out storage onto GCS, um, and then uh, separately run, ran Hadoop clusters, I mean, I, I think, can you share more about your thinking there and around any challenges you ran into when you did something at that scale? And, and I'm also curious, like when you store something in GCS, can one Hadoop cluster read from that? Can many Hadoop clusters read from that? And just talk about the pros and cons about that. Well, I'll answer the second question first, because that's the simpler one. And the first question I'll hand over to Lohit. Um, yes, one of the reasons why we store data in GCS is because then it can be shared across multiple users if they have the appropriate access. So there's access models around that. Um, so yeah, data stored in GCS can be used by multiple users from various clusters. That's the one mechanism how to share. Across it, many projects. So one GCS bucket can serve to external projects yeah, as well? That's right. Okay. So that, that goes back to, I think, this slide where you have one GCS 
in like Twitter product, but the revenue team can read from that if permissions are scoped. Correct. I see. And, and so, Loha, can you talk more about that, that decision to separate compute from storage uh, around any technical challenges you saw there? Uh, so, see, traditionally, like HDFS, when it, uh, uh, when it, be when it became very popular over the last decade, right? So the uh, local compute uh, was the key. Like basically, you, you, wherever the data is, you send your compute there uh, mm -hmm. to be more efficient. And over the years, what happened was, like you build these large clusters, say 2,000, 5,000 node clusters, and if you need more compute, there was no option, no other option other than either changing your machine configuration or adding extra nodes with more disk anyways, sure. right? So that model uh, kind of like changed altogether when the storage and the compute could be now separated independently, right? So for example, one example is that we tend to replicate the same data set across multiple different clusters based on use cases, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, with the uh, uh, storage system such as GCS, you just store one copy and then multiple um, compute instances can independently access them. Uh, so there is definitely a bit of a performance difference, but uh, for most part, uh, when you uh, factor in like how the network is laid out in GCP and how you're caching and how you're uh, organizing your jobs, uh, it, it kind of like adds up. I see. Uh, you saw no performance degradations in doing that type of separation? For most of the batch analytics, when we uh, did the performance evaluation uh, last year, uh, Derek and Dave also shared a lot of information uh, about that in the Google Next. So for most part, uh, we saw very consistent um, um, performance from uh, GCP, and then it was almost one is to one. Wow. I definitely want to plug Derek Lyon's uh, talk on YouTube about this as well. You guys did a very sophisticated analysis with like GridMix and Terrigen to understand your, your, um, your synthetic uh, simulation use cases within Google Cloud. So definitely do a uh, YouTube search on that. So before we take questions from the audience, I want to talk a bit about the new tools or Google Cloud platform improvements that were needed to support this migration. Um, Lohit, can you talk about the data retention, for example? Uh, sure. So um, GCS already provided like uh, object like lifecycle management tools to manage your uh, data to automatically delete it based on say create create time or something, right? So, but for us, it is much more complicated. As I mentioned earlier, we have data sets which have uh, like an hourly partition, and users usually configure complex retention tools such as any data which is older than say 30 days needs to be deleted automatically. And that decision happens based on the path uh, of that data set, not the actual create time or modification time. Uh, it's derived out of the path um, of that particular data set because there are cases where we could backfill, we could copy the entire data set to destination cluster, or we could scrub the data uh, to make some changes. So uh, such a, a functionality was not available on GCS. So with uh, Google engineers, um, um, there is now an open source uh, tool called uh, SDRS, Supplementary, Supplementary Data Retention Service, which is also open source, which kind of does a similar thing uh, on GCP as well. Where is it open source at? Uh, it's on uh, GitHub. I, be I believe it's on Google Cloud, Google Cloud um, yeah. platform, GitHub. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm trying to um, understand a little bit more around this. You're saying that object lifecycle management in GCS indeed works on object creation time. You showed us um, hourly time partitioned mm -hmm. data sets before. You're saying those are like event times? I event of what? Event of when the tweet took place? So those are the times uh, on which that uh, message got created. Uh, on the real-time cluster? On the real-time cluster. Okay, so so that's time-stamped, and you want to expire data based on that time, not the object creation time in, t in case there's delays on the log pipeline, I'm guessing. That is right. So as I said, when we copy the data from um, our HDFS cluster, like let's say, take an example of our initial copy, right? The seed copy, we would copy like few months of data onto GCS. There, we cannot set uh, OLM policy saying that anything older than 30 mm -hmm. days Get rid of it. It's Otherwise, just all new. Exactly. Yeah. So that, that is the reason why we had to come up with this tool. Interesting. Um, what about demigods, Rishali? That That's a interesting sounding name. Many gods, what is that? 
So, so Demigod is basically a group of services that we use to configure uh, Twitter's GCP platform for partly cloudy. Uh, the name Demigod comes from the fact that you know these are admin services, these are admin processes, but they have privileges that are exactly scoped to whatever they need to do. So it's like a demigod. It's a godlike service, but not quite with all of the admin privileges, but only that which what it needs to do. What do they do, though? They have semi-admin privileges. What do they do? So these, these services are responsible for creating buckets, creating shadow accounts, granting IAM policies on buckets, uh, you know, key management, all of that. Oh, interesting. So provisioning those service accounts that we talked about earlier or yes. um, making these hundreds or thousands of GCS buckets. It sounds like automation tools. Is that fair to say? Yes. So these are automated tools uh, that Google, uh, uh, that we have uh, that are running in GCP. Uh, these are driven, these are event driven services. So for example, when users join LDAP groups or when we make config changes to our files, that's when these services get triggered and they run. And then they reset the state of the system to what it's expected to be. So if somebody makes a manual change on a bucket, uh, the demigod service will go and reset the state to whatever it should be. Interesting. What about the bucket move rename tool? Right. So as we were working with buckets and you know getting familiar with GCP, uh, we realized that we needed the ability to move buckets across projects or to change the name of buckets. Now, we wanted to work with buckets as we were pro working on our design, right? That is when we wanted a tool from Google, and we put forth this request to Google, and they built an open source tool. Uh, it's on GitHub as well. Uh, yeah. So it can move buckets across projects. It can rename them. Uh, there are several configuration options that it takes. Uh, cool. Yeah, feel free to look it up. And that's on GitHub, uh, I believe, for Google Cloud Platform as well. I think that's a really useful tool. GCS buckets are globally namespaced, right? So I think you have to have just one name. So I'm guessing this tool does something like deletes that name and stores the data temporarily, then recreates that name in a different project and just moves it over? Yes. So, so it, this tool basically creates a temporary swap bucket. It first copies over all of the data. And when it starts that, it actually locks the incoming bucket so that you don't keep making changes there. Mm -hmm. And then once all of the data has been copied over, it will delete this bucket and then recreate the same bucket in a different project or with a different name and then copy over the data from the temporary bucket into that. Yeah. That sounds super useful. Um, Yub, can you tell us a little bit about the HDFS to GCS checksum feature? Yeah, this is one feature that we added um, in collaboration with, with Google in order to make sure that the checksums match all the way from the source all the way through to the target. The checksumming mechanism in HDFS is different than in GCS, and this is a feature that's been added on HDFS side to make sure that the checksums can check all the way through from end to end. Very cool. And I believe this work was actually done in open source Apache HDFS, correct? Yes, initially one of my team members implemented this first um, and is running that because not all of our clusters have been upgraded to that version yet. And then we worked with Google engineers and it's done in open source, yes. Very cool. And finally, Yub, can you tell us a little bit about GCS Connector 2.0 performance improvements? I should tell, let the audience know that in the next week or two, we are going to increment the version of GCS Connector from 1.x to 2.0. And um, there's a couple of dozen major improvements in there, uh, a lot of which were driven by the Twitter project. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of that, Yup? Yeah, one of the features that's been added is this cooperative locking mechanism feature where you can imagine an object store function is very different than a file system. In an object store, there's no such thing as an inode, where directories are a first-class citizen. So as items move around, um, it's possible that you know, people move directories. Cool. So it locks a directory, I, I suppose, before it, uh, it, uh, it, it modifies that directory. Yep, a lock is taken so that multiple users moving around directories you know, don't cool. collide with one And another. I believe this is an alpha stage right now, but it should be coming out very soon. All right, so to start wrapping up, um, you, can you tell us a little bit about this special URL that you had talked about at the very beginning? Yeah, Google is, is hosting a, a page on, uh, on cloud.google.com for slash Twitter. Um, we'll be you know, hosting a, a list of links there and resources and the things that we're working on together and collaborating on. Um, we're working on a series of blog posts, so those will be uh, linking there as well. 
and the, you know, other talks will be linked there, so people want to follow along and collaborate with us on these projects, they can, you can find uh, all this information over there. Cool, and yeah, I, I would love to see a lot more um, of the details of what you guys are doing in the next year or so. Um, I did want to give a plug to a few upcoming Twitter talks at next, um, in the next couple of days. Um, so take a quick screenshot of this if you guys are interested. And for the live Q&A, check out Twitter. <laughs>